I had a transition team that essentially started uh, and went out and took a, kind of a 360 degree assessment of TRADOC and the things that TRADOC were doing. And I got a lot of good feedback. I mean, sometimes you don't want to hear some things and sometimes you do. But the only area uh, that we had that I felt singularly uh, had nothing but positive feedback, not so much for what had been accomplished, but for, for what could be accomplished uh, was the Army learning concept. So I think that's critically important and sort of identifies uh, the challenge uh, that we face. There's a lot of promise here, uh, but there's also a lot of work to be done. I'll, I'll tell you another, to preface uh, my more formal remarks, let me give you my sort of assessment of this young generation of, of officers and non-commissioned officers, who in my opinion, I mean a lot of people say this, the, the next greatest generation, but the reality of it is, were it not for them and their ability to adapt in the early days of the Iraq campaign, uh, we would not be sitting where we are today. The fact of the matter was success in that war derived uh, from their ability to adapt. I had the best job you could have other than being in the fight, which was to sit right next to Tommy Franks uh, in the early days of the war, sort of bird's eye view, watching as he went through things. And then, as Baghdad was taken, then taking the teams into Iraq to get a much closer look at how the war was going. And I can tell you that it was a grand news story uh, during the first couple months of this war. And everything that I did, I came back, would, would fly back to Washington frequently, be, uh, brief the Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, went out to Crawford, briefed the President. I was on the speaking circuit on how well the war went in the first, in the first uh, two months. But then I gotta tell you, we got into the summer of 2003. Uh, and I got sent back to Iraq with a lessons learned team and the story was absolutely grim in terms of our inability to adapt to the situation that was around us. Now there were bright spots and I can tell you that it was a direct reflection of how close the junior leader was to the action, how quickly they adapted. And uh, as I came back, one of my major findings in a much more controversial report that I gave in the fall of 2003, one that didn't get quite the invitations to brief high-level people, I might add. Um, but uh, it was more, it was 13 major problem areas where we were failing to adapt in this war. The one positive point was that this generation of young leaders at the, at the platoon, company, battalion level had a much clearer situation of the facts on the ground and was in fact adapting highly successfully uh, to the circumstances around them. And I think many of us know that um, sort of anecdotally or through our personal experience, but systemically as we looked at this thing, it was truly impressive the goodness that was radiating from the bottom of the formation uh, and the fact of the matter is where we were struggling elsewhere and that seemed in some ways a mix of sort of political views uh, that were coming from Washington that were sort of meeting the ground reality and that happened somewhere uh, around the palace area uh, back in the Baghdad area. So what about this young generation uh, of leaders and where are they in our army today? I think an important point is uh, that in many ways they are who they were as the result of existing systems uh, of education and training. Uh, that they had been a part of the formal systems that the army had given them, the, the education and the training that had taken place. And yet, in their hour of need, they were failed fundamentally by TRADOC and other organizations to get out ahead and lead in adaptation. And I can also tell you that following my assignment uh, as the uh, head of lessons learned uh, in Iraq, I did that for about 14 months, I got sent to the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California. And I got told directly by the Chief of Staff of the Army, you will change this organization or I'm not sure it's any longer relevant. In other words, to get out of the high intensity tank battle and refocus it on the problem set that we were dealing with uh, in Iraq. And uh, the first thing I attempted to do uh, was to make contact with Training and Doctrine Command and ask for help. And it wasn't that I didn't find um, cooperative and understanding people at TRADOC, it was that they were not resources, resourced and that they were tied to processes that could not help me uh, in, that, in that endeavor. And so essentially I ended up uh, working through organizations like 
like JIDO, other organizations where there was money outside of the traditional Army structures that I could get without a lot of restrictions uh, and make changes very quickly uh, to deal with the problem. I also sent observer controllers directly uh, into the fight because I could not find anyone elsewhere in the institution that had the necessary access to understand the problem set and bring the elements of that problem set back uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the training center. And so uh, as I did that, uh, I realized fundamentally that as time went on, either we were going to have to get, a, get back into this game, or as the war drew to a conclusion, I'm not sure that this young generation of leaders will accept the reimposition of the traditional learning methods on them. I'm just convinced that they think, and, and I'm not sure, I believe deep down inside that you have to have rigor, that you have to have discipline, that you have to have focus uh, in your training sessions. I think a lot of these youngsters said, look, we made this up as we went along. We will continue to make this up uh, as we go along. My belief is that there's a lot of goodness in that, but the fact of the matter is you have to have the fundamental structure and discipline involved in, in any kind of educational system that keeps things focused. And I think that the, the, the educators in this room would certainly agree uh, that, uh, that you have to combine these, these two characteristics uh, to be successful. So my belief is fundamentally, if we do not capture the key elements of the Army learning concept that have to focus on sort of the elements of the learner, this tremendously experienced generation of young leaders, share their experiences in the classroom, and at the same time impose some level of rigor uh, in regard to their studies and their focus and their learning outcomes, uh, I think we're going to have some significant problems. And I think um, we have made withdrawal on account uh, for a period of time, and that is on the educational system that we had. We have this window of opportunity, and that's what I tell people as I take, take over TRADOC uh, and move on, that this window will open, and if we do not have answers for this generation, if we do not capture their imagination uh, their experience and their professionalism, it will exist without, outside our organization. And in fact, uh, that, that will be uh, truly uh, tragic to the military profession. I, I'm also um, very concerned about, I think we're launching this campaign called a Profession of Arms uh, campaign, which I think is absolutely essential. I think that that will provide, I think, sort of the guideposts when you think about that in terms of where we are with the Army learning concept, that it will provide the guidepost to help steer us in terms of what are the basic competencies and, and subject areas that we need to focus on. For a long time, we were uh, somewhat adrift from our profession. At least I felt that way uh, growing up. I felt that way when I commanded the National Training Center for three years. Uh, that in fact, we had failed to identify the critical core competencies of our profession uh, and that we were literally a, a, a game of peewee soccer uh, that was chasing the next major statistic that came out or the next major fad uh, without linking that back to a professional body of knowledge. I see the Army learning concept as having the fundamental ability uh, to tie these, these things together. Let's, let's talk about technology. This, this generation of young soldiers, amazing, having just spent a year in Iraq traveling around to FOBs and watching them operate. Um, it, it, it's phenomenal, um, their ability to master digital communications devices. It's absolutely amazing. But what's also amazing is the dynamic that digital communications devices has had on what we would call the group dynamic of group cohesion and group unity. Let's describe what goes on. We, we get back from a mission, everybody jumps off the MRAP, the, the armored vehicle they're riding in, and runs into their CHU, their housing unit, and flips on their, their digital device, whether it be what kind of games they play or communicating with the family, and they don't talk. No one talks. And when we're on mission, all we talk about is the mission. So again, I find that absolutely hard to believe. So here's something that we, we see as a great advantage because of the ability for information, exchanging information. We see that then overriding the, tradi the traditional dynamic of soldiers in combat and buddyship and hanging out and cohesion and sharing experiences and information. 
I'm not saying that that's you know, widespread, but it's a critical and fundamental dynamic that our leaders today have to deal with. There are many upsides to be able to gain knowledge uh, off a digital device, but it has to be balanced against the context of understanding that what we're doing is a fundamentally human enterprise, and it has to do with human skills and interacting uh, with other people. 